Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back again. Uh, happy Thursday. It is uh, officially Definition Gin, we talked about last week. Um, so yeah, so we will be talking a little bit about gin, uh, why gin is so important. Since we talked about all the other spirits, why does gin get its own class? Um, well, we are a Spanish tapas restaurant, and so gin is a very, very important, uh, important imp proponent of that. So yeah, let's get started with what gin is. What is gin? Um, gin is going to be a spirit just like the rest. Um, you know, it still has to go through the same distillation process, all the same. Uh, so we know we have to start with some sort of fermentation. Uh, but what a lot of people like to describe gin as is essentially a spin-off of a vodka, more or less. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna be malt based, so there's gonna be sorts sorts of wheat, maybe maybe rye, barley as the base, and distilled just the same as vodka. So filtered, so you want that really clean, clean spirit, which is essentially tasteless, so that when you redistill with your botanics, most prominently juniper, which is what we what we uh, think when we think gin. Um, is is a lot more forward. You get some of those flavor profiles. They're 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 in there. Um, so things like uh, there there are all sorts of different styles of gin. That's kind of what we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to cover why gin is so important. Um, and obviously we have our tonic bottles sitting here. So the gin and tonic and uh, and and why that's why that's so important. So yeah. So what is gin? Who's famous for this delicious spirit? Um, who's famous for the spirit? We like to give the credit on this one to the Brits. Um, so it started in about six, uh, in about six, in the 1600s, late 1600s, 17th century. Um, the king at the time put a put a tariff on, um, put a tariff on uh, uh, French brandy. So at the time in 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 uh, in, in Britain, the uh, the major spirit of choice was going to be brandy. Everybody was drinking brandy. They're drinking, drinking their cognac, but more more or less brandy. Um, whereas the king thought he, this is a great opportunity. Everybody in this country is drinking um, for whether it be Benicia Valley or whatever. Um, that's the thing that they're doing. So this is a great market for us to capitalize on. So by doing so, he decided, well, that's a great market for us to maybe pick up. So not only did he put a gigantic tariff on, um, on, on importing brandy, French brandy, but all spirits, spirits in particular, spirits. So if you wanted hard liquor, it, had, it was going to have a very steep tariff, which was going to make it extremely, extremely expensive. So it was also a, a, a class divide. Uh, people that were you know, of higher class could afford to drink the French brandy. You know, whether it cost them $13 on the other side of the border, you know, our, 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 our American dollars now, it was going to cost them roughly $40 at the time. So it was a huge class distinction. So the lower class people or the middle class people were drinking gin at the time because they could get that at the same affordable price um, without uh, having to deal with the tariffs because they're being made, made there in the, in the country. So um, that's a little bit of the background history as to where it came from. So as early as uh, 11, 1150 in, uh, in Italy, uh, monks were distilling gin for its medicinal practices. Um, the original gin, they say, we talk about, is going to be, uh, at the bottom of your sheet there, Holland gin. So, essentially, uh, Dutch gin. So, this is called Jennifer. This is the one of the original gins. Uh, this is the first gin that you're essentially going to have uh, put out there. So, this gin um, does not drink like a standard gin that we think of. When we think of gin, we think of botanics. We think of things really spicy, um, like cardamom and fennel, uh, uh, juniper as well, pine, as we think is like pine trees. Um, so, those flavor profiles are entirely lost on this. Um, and that comes down to the distillation process. So with gin, the art of distillation is extremely, extremely skillful and, and very important um, to the, whatever product you're getting ready to produce. So with the Jennifer, uh, instead of doing things like, like beef eater, um, really, really mass produced gins, what they're going to do is they're going to distill from their, essentially get their vodka base. They're going to actually infuse that vodka, right? We talked about once you've infused it, you're not distilling the essence of something. You're not distilling the fruit of something. Once you've infused it, it's become a cordial, right? So they're going to infuse it to make those flavor profiles really dominant, uh, really predominant. So from that point, they're going to redistill again, and they'll have a lot more of that. It'll be a lot easier to translate those flavors. But when we talk about really heavy crafts like Hendrix, things like St. George, now we're talking very subtle flavor profiles that, that come through distilling the essence, not necessarily through infusions, okay? Jennifer, we think about as the original gin. Um, this distillation process is going to take place where they will be starting with their base, but it's very, very malty. So the filtration process, as we think about in gin, is being a really, really light, really easy drinking gin. Um, very crisp, refreshing, as opposed to like a whiskey, which we think of like a white whiskey is essentially like an unfiltered vodka, right? So those really malty, grainy flavors that we're starting with for our base, those are going to be more, uh, more, more found in flavors like, like Jennifer. Okay, so Jennifer is actually Dutch for j juniper, which is, you know, the, the original name for gin. Um, but, so, 
Jennifer is going to be something that really captures those multi flavors. So all of those flavor profiles aren't going to be filtered through charcoal or not going to be filtered through, through, through diamonds or anything along those lines. Um, a lot of those flavors are still very much so in there in their clear, their clear neutral spirit. And then they redistill with the juniper and then they redistill. So the distillation process is not as, as extravagant as the newer gins that we see on the shelves nowadays. Um, but it is extremely you know, unique to what it is. Um, very, very easy to drink on the front palate. Comes off tastes almost tasteless like a vodka, very, very thin. And it finishes a lot maltier than anything. So the juniper uh, is a very, very subtle note as opposed to a London dry where it's going to be really in your face. Okay? Um, so fun little fact about the, the, the Jennifer. Um, Jennifer in World War I was consumed. This is where we get the, the term Dutch courage or liquid courage. It comes from Jennifer. Um, where before World War I, before battle, when they were you know, walking along, they all carried them around on their necks on little shots. So they would carry them, and, and right before a battle was about to take place, they'd rip it off and they would all shoot it, right? Um, so they were getting their Dutch courage, and they made them a little more fearless and ready for battle, okay? Um, this one is, is, is great, served on the rocks, neat. Um, your, your standard bar is going to keep this in a freezer, actually, um, and will be consumed neat. So delicious, delicious beverage. But again, this one absolutely stands out in almost its own category as, as more or less a different spirit. Jennifer is what we consider it. Okay, um, so moving moving along, we've got other um, other fun things. So flavor profile and distillation of standard gin and the meth and the methodization of, of those. So juniper and coriander, um, based with added botanicals of clove, lemon, orange rind, licorice, aniseed, angelica, orris root, almonds, cardamom, and cassia bark. Right. Um, so spirit is going to be grain based, like we said. Wheat, rye, even cane molasses as well, depending on what, which, which, which product we're talking about. Um, then it's going to be redistilled with that botanic flavoring. Okay, so again, almost like a vodka that we're going to continue to distill to filter it. And, and, and in the finishing notes, the finishing touches, like finishing your little, your, your saute dish by throwing that little, that little pat of butter in there to get that flavor on there at the end. You want that flavor to bleed through and not get lost. That's when the botanics are being added at some of those final stages of the distillation. Okay, so that's how they get through. Um, but again, it's mostly through suspending and vaporizing uh, uh, the, the flavors into the spirit. Okay, um, we've got other things like uh, like compound gins as well, um, which we'll get into in a little bit, and we'll kind of decide whether or not we want to put those in the in the category of gin, or we want to put those in the category of uh, of maybe like a pims or like a cordial. Okay, um, so whenever we talk about gins, um, you'll hear us say constantly. Um, is it, a, is, is it more of a masculine gin or is it more of a feminine gin? Um, and that really, really references the dryness of the gin. Okay, so again, people that have had gin, they say, oh, God, I, I want nothing to do with that. I want nothing to do with that gin. I, I, I do not do gin. I do not do pine needles. And that's what they think. Um, literally like pine. Um, anybody that's ever smelled a juniper, a juniper bush or tasted a juniper berry knows exactly what that flavor profile is like. Um, so in terms of those flavors, that's something that would be considered more of a masculine gin. Something like a London Dry. Uh, beef eater, right? Beef eater is going to be more along the lines of that really dry gin. Um, really in your face with those botanics almost knock you over with the juniper, right? But the juniper doesn't necessarily have to be that way. That's just how it's portrayed in a, in a standard London dry. Um, so we have multiple London dries up here. We also have the tank array. Um, yeah. So fun gin. This is going to be your more, more, more common gin. This is going to be in our well, okay? So for happy hour, we're going to be serving these ones as a substitute for any of these other gins for $5 instead of the market price. That's what we do. So if you get your Juniper Rose and Cucumber with Hendrix, for happy hour it's $5, we offer it with the beef eater. Okay? Um, but yeah, London Dry, this is going to be the kind of style, this is, this is a great uh, trademark of what a masculine gin is. As well as the Tanqueray. The Tanqueray we essentially think is as the front runner. Um, this is the standard Tanqueray, Tanqueray London Dry. Okay? So these two are going to be very masculine in your face. Um, botanics, and that's really the, the predominant flavor profiles. Whereas we have other gins that are gonna be more along the lines of feminine, right? And we think about feminine gins, we're, 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 we're pushed over here with the exclusion of, of the Jennifer. We're pushed more toward this area over here. So we've got things like Boodles, things like Citadel, things like Bombay. Still all sorts of juniper in there. Juniper flavor profiles definitely gonna be part of this. But the biggest thing is that that's not necessarily the only aspect that they focus on. We talked about coriander, we talked about cardamom, we talked about all these fun flavors. Citrus, orange rind, these are more along the lines of a feminine gin, right? Soft, very, very soft, very easy drinking, very light on the palate, like vodka on the palate, but the flavor profile is still there. 
So you still get some of that juniper, but it's going to be more along the lines of citrus. Very, very lemony. When I think boodles, I think about biting into a lemon, that nice soft citrus. Adding a little bit of soda with some, with some lemon juice, adding a little bit of tonic. Um, it's going to blend really well and be extremely easy to drink. Citadel as well. Citadel is also going to be along the lines as well as Bombay Sapphire. These are going to be very feminine gins. Very, very soft, very delicate, very pretty gins as opposed to the masculine piney in your face. Okay? So two different kind of categories. Either of these, any gin over here will work. Um, however, we do like to throw uh, Hendrix into a different category. But, uh, yeah, so on the topic of these... On the, of these uh, masculine gins over here we also we like to give it up to the to the to the brits in terms of their gin and their and their expertise in gin again they were kind of the founding fathers of the gin but it's changed a little bit um so citadel we have is a nice french gin um different style very very light very easy drinking again the feminine style um but this is going to be a french style gin so this is, this is this goes through french insulation um whereas other masculines that try to almost emulate this this London dry style, we've got things as as close to us and as local as Death's Door, right? So Death's Door, um, great gin, lots and lots of fun. Um, it's it's a great substitute for Tanqueray. It's it's almost a little bit more in your face with the juniper with the Tanqueray. Um, you've got other gins that, as as we see the as we see the Citadel bottle here, we've got uh, juniper. We've got almond, we've got rose, we've got cinnamon, we've got cumin, we've got angelica, all the way around, nutmeg, all sorts of ingredients. There are over 20 ingredients that go into just, just flavoring this with the essence of all of those flavors are going to be captured in the Citadel gin. Whereas Death's Door, as complex as a, of a gin that it is, it relies upon juniper, fennel, and coriander. That's it. Those are the only ingredients that are going to be redistilled into the Death's Door. Um, so it makes it really unique and really shows off what the distiller can do. Uh, but again, more along the lines of the masculine, they really made that juniper present, which means it was very piney. Okay, you kind of have to taste it to understand it, which you will. Um, but yeah, so Death's Door, um, this, this one comes out of Wisconsin. As you see here, we've got the Death, uh, uh, Death's Door Passage, right? Right next to Door County there. And that's because of the number of shipwrecks that have gone through there and not made it out. Uh, so that's why they call it Death's Door Passage. So Death's Door Gin, Death's Door uh, Spirits. Okay, uh, but great local option just on the other side of Lake Michigan for us there. And um, yeah, an awesome, awesome showcase of, of the new world, the new page that's being turned to gin. Um, keeping those things in line, like we talk about Tanqueray being this extremely masculine gin, they also make a gin called Tanqueray 10. Um, some distillers in the world, some distillers consider this to be the best gin in the world, uh, whatever that means, it's all about your palate. So. Um, but it has won countless awards um, for being a very, very hand, nice handcrafted gin. Um, one fun, one fun uh, profile of this gin is going to be that it's, it makes for a great martini. So it's not just the flavor profile of lemon. It's not just the flavor profile of the juniper, but it's very well balanced, right? So you almost we wouldn't put this over here, but we also would kind of keep it out of this area. We put it over here, and we would almost put this into the category of like what is a Plymouth gin now. We think of like a Plymouth gin. Um, the style of Plymouth gin, in America at least, has kind of been lost, the actual style itself. Um, it's, and now we kind of think of Plymouth more along the lines of just a, of a, of a brand, right? Plymouth gin, they also make a navy strength gin. Um, but those styles are, are meant to play off of both flavor profiles, right? So when we talk about, well, is Plymouth a masculine gin or is it a feminine gin? It's really what you want to do with it. If you want to throw Plymouth into a, a classic aviation and have, the, have the, the fresh lemon juice play off of that gin, it'll sway toward that direction. If you want to muddle some juniper berries in your cocktail and splash some soda, it'll, it'll, it'll lean in that direction. So it, it's really great for bartenders. It's, it's a great toy for us to play with. Um, but that style is something that's been adapted and kind of lost the title of a Plymouth gin. And that's really, personally, my opinion, I would put the, the Tanqueray 10 in that, in that kind of style, where it really has all sorts of, it has best of both worlds. Um, another one, I also strategically place this one right next to the 2 James gin. This is going to be from Corktown in Detroit. Um, so it's a, it's a great local gin. Um, it's going to be in our Mint and Made Gin and Tonic. So all sorts of mint, what's Michigan. The gin is Michigan as well as we use some Mich some Traverse City cherries. Um, so everything Michigan about this about this uh, this spirit. Great distillery. They do a great job. It's a beautiful bottle as well. Beautiful display. Um, but again, makes for a great classic martini. Not too much that needs to go into it. Whereas you know we're not we're not weighing it down with a fresh lemon juice. We're not weighing it down with something like Luxardo Maraschino. It it really is showcased by itself with all those subtle flavor profiles that are already in there. Um, but great option. These are going to be our two top shelf options. If you're trying to upsell, these are the two that you want to go to. They're going to run about nine fifty a shot, as opposed to six out of the well. Okay, so great option to upsell. Um, but even Citadel is at seven dollars is an upsell. So something to keep in mind. 
Um, we talk about this in-between flavor profile, these in-between gins. We almost get in this style of, of what we consider, what, what some consider a flavored gin. Um, and technically a flavored gin, the original flavored gin is going to be uh, Old Tom's gin. Okay, and Old Tom it became popular in England during the 18th century. Gin was slightly sweetened with sugar syrup and botanicals. Okay, this is literally like a, a, a gin lemon drop as you drink it. Um, it's still going to be 80 proof. And it still has the title gin on it. Nowadays, it's something that we would classify as a cordial because they add the sugar and they add any of those botanics and flavorings after the distillation. Okay, so they don't re-distill like a lot of these other gins do. Um, so they add all these flavor profiles afterwards. It's extremely light and drink. You could drink it neat. Not that I would suggest it. Um, but just to really appreciate the flavor profiles, you could. Um, it's, it's very sweet. It's very big body, big viscous, very viscous. Um, that's because of the sugar. Um, but again, this is something that we would consider more along the lines of a flavored gin, right? Um, it kind of it kind of lost it kind of lost the popularity when all the other gins were up and coming. Um, but the people that fell in love with it are still absolutely in love with it. They come in and they ask for it by request. So great gin, um, and Heyman's is a great brand. Um, so yeah, so other flavored gins and styles of the flavored gins. We've got this great collection over here of the Saint George. We've got the dry rye here. Um, this one drinks very similarly to almost a vodka, where it's very, very light. Um, that's not they, they decided to not necessarily um, hit it with botanics um, of juniper and having that juniper flavor very forward. They wanted it almost in the style of, the, of a Jennifer in the sense that it's very light and almost malty. Um, so it makes for a great Vesper, which is going to be a gin and vodka cocktail. And instead of what a dry vermouth, um, we're going to be using a, a blanc vermouth, whether it be Lule or Coqui Americano. Okay, so it's great for that. It's, it, it, it blends really, really well. Um, and, and adds a, for a very unique flavor. So again, you'd have to taste it to try it. Another line that they do is called the St. George Terroir. Um, this is probably my favorite gin right now. Um, I've really enjoyed playing with this one. It's very botanic, but it's, again, a very unique flavor profile, but the strongest uh, flavor profiles that I get are gonna be flavors of, of eucalyptus. Almost like that menthol-y, take your breath away with how, with how clean it is. Um, but absolutely delicious. Um, it's funny because it's got this little green label on the top as the St. George dry rye has the red. And every time I drink this, I just think green. I think green like 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 what koalas eat. So that's 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 how I feel. Um, but yeah, so this is going to be very similar um, to an in-between style or almost like a flavored gin, but they're not technically flavored gins. Um, but they are very unique and it's something that's new. Uh, it's like new world style of gin, just like we have new world wine. So um, great. St. George based out of California. Another fun thing about... Uh, St. George is that for every bottle that they sell, they donate a dollar or they donate a, a certain percentage to um, California uh, wilderness. So to go to go back to rebuilding the forest there. Um, this is from San Francisco area, Bay Area. Um, but yeah, they do a great job. They also make another one called Botanivore. We don't carry that one in the house. Um, haven't really found a niche for that one just yet. So we're not picking that one up just yet. But we could. You never know. Um, more so along the lines and what really set the set the tone and set the curve for for places like for, for distillers like Des Door and for distillers like St. George and Two James is Hendrix. Hendrix was that was that first gin that came out there that was just so different. Is this really gin? Um, as appropriate as it may be or may not be, um, uh, a wise bar guest once told me that gin is like sex. If you don't like it, you're not doing it right. There's got to be a better way to do it. So whether it be from this category or this category, if those two aren't fitting your fancy, let's make up another category and let's and let's let's sculpt it to you, right? These distillers have been distilling for centuries. Um, so Hendrix Distillers is a Scottish gin. Again, so we're so we're so we're walking away. We we've we've stepped out of the realms of, of Britain, right? We've 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 touched base on Holland, touched base on France, touched a little bit of America over here, and now we're moving into the Scots. Um, so why would they have experience distilling if they're from Scotland? They distill scotch. So Glenfiddich, think of scotch as like Glenfiddich. Um, if you guys haven't heard of that, it's, it's very, very classic, uh, classic scotch, one of the most classic scotches that are out there in everyday shelves. Um, great scotch, all sorts of different years that they do, um, but they were the, the original company uh, started with scotch and that's what they did, Glenfiddich. Also a scotch called Belvania, which is an Isla. Um, very, very peaty scotch. Um, but just to kind of talk about the craft, they have a 50 year that they sell in Beverly Hills. Um, they sell for a one ounce pour, it's $3,500 a shot. Um, so that's the kind of craft that these guys do. And again, that's a little bit of glamour attached, attached to that from, in Beverly Hills, but nonetheless, it kind of shows off what they're able to do if they flex their guns. And another fun thing that they distill, of course, is, is arguably the world's, the world's uh, 
most favorite gin. And that's Hendrix gin. So it really brought a new aspect, and it, 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 it confused people. It threw people off. They wanted to know if it was cordial, if it was actually a gin, and it is a gin. Um, so when we talk about when we talk about Hendrix, we talk about things um, that are out of the ordinary, right? Um, so Hendrix actually has is going to be distilled not only with juniper, um, not only with coriander, but also is going to distill the essence of cucumber and rose, which make it extremely unique. Um, and at the time was the only gin to do that on the market, um, to really take in the flavor profile of cucumber. And cucumber in the, in the mixology world is a, is a great, fun new toy. Uh, I say new within the last five to ten years, but nice muddled cucumber. Anytime you sell a Hendrickson tonic, whether it be with house tonic or just standard tonic off the gun, um, always suggest a, a muddled cucumber. All it takes is those little subtle accents to really liven up those flavors. So again, it's it's going to be distilled with the essence of cucumber. So not actual cucumbers. They're not they're not infusing the cucumber. They're actually distilling them with the rest of the product. So they're going to get some of that flavor in there. The vapor they're they're suspended and vaporized and and then distilled. So same goes with the rose, with rose water as well. Um, so yeah, very very citrusy. Um, so a little bit of lemon goes a long way in Hendrix. A muddled cucumber goes a really long way with Hendrix. Um, whether it be on the rocks or whether it be with tonic. So, great option. Um, yeah, very, very important, especially especially for our company. In 2012, we were the largest uh, the largest buyer of Hendrix in the state of Michigan, which is pretty exciting at Safa's Restaurant. So, pretty excited about that. Um, but, yeah, uh, amazing gin. And um, give it a taste for sure. Other things to keep in mind with gin, we talk about spirits. What are the classifications of spirits? Uh, the classi classifications of spirits are it has to be at least 80 proof, no uh, no no fruit, no anything added post distillation, correct? Um, gin, on the other hand, happens to run along the lines of, of a much higher proof. So instead of 80 proof, we're talking more along the lines of a 90 proof, 92 proof standard. So we have things like like uh, like beef eater, beef eater, which is in our well for six dollars, is going to be uh, 47 proof just as it is. So in, or 47 percent. So instead of that standard 40% that we're used to seeing with vodkas, even even like Basil Hayden's bourbon, which is a well-known bourbon, um, so whiskeys, gin just happens to be distilled at a higher, at a, at a little bit higher because that's how they like to drink. Um, keeping that in mind, we're talking about the strength of gin. While we're talking about the the, the brand of Heyman's, why don't we talk about Royal Dock, um, which is their their Navy strength gin. Right? Uh, more po more popularly known is uh, Plymouth. Unfortunately, you can't get Royal Dock in the state anymore, but. Plymouth uh, makes a Navy Strength gin as well. There are many Navy Strength drink, uh, gins out there. Um, and a little fun little fun story about Navy Strength gin. Um, it makes for a fun little show. Any, anything over 100 proof is always going to make for a fun show. If we light it on fire, we can, do, we, can, we can impress somebody with a last word or an aviation that way if they're not bourbon drinkers, which we like to burn. Um, but we're looking at 114 proof. So the, the Navy strength is going to be a little stronger, and they decided that 57% didn't necessarily need to be 60%, didn't want to be 50%, but 57% they found that on the Navy, on the Navy ships, if for whatever reason they're in a downpour and you know, their, their, their gunpowder got wet and they couldn't, they couldn't light it, this was strong enough that they could pour it on their gunpowder and get, it to, and get, it to, get a spark. Um, they, could get, they, could get a, they could get a flame from that one. So it's kind of a cool little story. And also the the navy navy the navy men like most people like to think is that's how strong it needs to be for the people in the navy to really understand it and enjoy it. So that's that's also another uh, another opinion. So yeah, so fun little thing there. Um, and um, yeah, so again, just to recap, kind of uh, kind of the most important the most important facts here that we've got are the masculine and the feminine families, um, and really really targeting your 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 audience. Somebody that says they don't like gin, they might just not. They might not have had the right gin. They might not have had it served the right way. Um, and they're again, if they're making that little transition, they're making a, a fun transition. We always want to start on this side of the screen. Okay, um, this side of the screen is going to be not only necessarily just drier, a little more, a little more in your face, um, but also a little more subtle um, and and something that's that's meant to be appreciated. You know, um, so this is a great transitional uh, uh, part of the gin. Okay. Um, last but not least, um, one fun thing. Again, we talk about the gin and tonics here and why they're so important. In Spain, when you go out to go get some gin and tonics, um, when you go out to go get a beverage, go, go out to get cocktails. In Ann Arbor, we think, well, we're, should, we go to, should we go to Ravens Club? Should we go to, should we go to Aventura? Do we want to go to Savas for happy hour? We think maybe last word. Where are we going to go get a good cocktail? What do you want? Are you in a Manhattan mood? Are you in an old-fashioned mood? Are you in an aviation mood? 
Um, are you in a gin and tonic mood? Uh, in Spain, it's, it's, it's essentially across the board, what kind of gin and tonic are we going to have tonight? We drink in doubles, we drink in triples, we drink in, we drink in house tonic, we drink in Q-tonic. Are we going to have garnishes? What are we going to do? What are we drinking tonight? Um, so it's kind, of a, it's kind of a fun and different, different experience there. And for that reason, we've played on it. So many places have house, different house tonics there. They make their own tonic almost everywhere. Um, so that's a great, great, great flavor profile. Um, a, little, a little history behind the tonic and the gin and tonics and why they came about. In Britain, um, during, during the time of, of malaria, when it was becoming an issue, I mean, in all of Europe, malaria was a, a real problem that they didn't deal with. Um, the cure for malaria is the quinine. And quinine is found in cinchona, cinchona bark from cinchona trees. So it's literally a tree bark. Um, so that cinchona, there was such heavy amounts of it that it would cure you of malaria. But they soaked it in water to extract it. That was the only way that they get the extraction out. So they soaked it in water to get the, 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 the bark out, and then they would just drink that water. And they started to carbonate it because they were figuring like, oh my gosh, this is just so harsh, it's so bitter. Um, the flavors just were not what they wanted. And so uh, to kind of counteract that flavor that they, they, they wanted, instead of the soda, they started adding sugar, and they started adding gin. Gin was the only thing at the time that could really mask that flavor of the, of the quinine. Um, now... We have quinine as one of the little elements to make our tonic water, and anywhere that you anywhere that you get tonic water, you will not be getting the, the amount of uh, uh, quinine that they had at the time. Um, we're using less than a quarter of what they use for quinine. Too much quinine is not a good thing. It can cause blindness. Uh, you can get sick. Um, it's, bad. It's, it's it's bad for your skin. It's it's just not necessarily the best thing. But um, in a little bit of it, it's it's a good thing for you. It's fine, and it also helps cure malaria again. So um, for that reason, gin and tonic. Why not? What, that's, 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 that's like the best medicine I've ever heard of. So, um, again, that's how it started there. So we'll get, we'll get started with what a gin and tonic is and, why we, and how we serve them here. So all of our gin and tonics come in these goblets here, which are pretty fun. Um, and that's how they're served, almost like a gigantic fishbowl. Um, and what we're going to do, whether it be on the bar, whether it be in the well, um, to make your drink, it's, it's almost like a display. It's almost fun. Um, instead of using tongs here, we use, we use um, scoops. But in Spain, they were very, very big on their tongs. So here we're going to scoop. We've got some ice that we'll throw in here. And across the board, this is how they're prepared. When you're done with this, when you're done with this YouTube video, if you don't believe me, look, up, look it up on YouTube, and you'll see how to properly do it. So we'll get that settled in there. We'll get the ice ready to go. Now we've got our glass prepared. But now that we're preparing it, we're going to take our spoon, and we're going to chill the glass. OK? So you chill the glass, get the glass nice and cold, because in order to properly drink a, and enjoy a gin and tonic, the glass has to be nice and frosty, frozen cold. So we're stirring it to get any of that excess water out, chill it out, but the, the, the heat transfer is going to leave us with a little bit of a pool of water at the bottom of the gin and tonic, which is why we are going to take our strainer and strain out the water. Okay, now that we have that excess water out, since it is appropriate, we lost some ice, we'll add a little bit more. It has to be very, very cold. Okay, I'm going to walk you through the juniper, rose, and cucumber. Juniper, rose, and cucumber is going to use the Hendrix gin again. So we'll do a six count of that. It's going to be a nice ounce and a half pour there, a little healthy. Now that we've got the gin, we're going to throw in our garnishes. So some of our garnishes are going to consist of some juniper berries here. And these are really for uh, aesthetics. Nice and fun and pretty. All right. So Hendrix, we know that we have the, the essence, not only the essence of, but also have juniper in the Hendrix. We have the essence, uh, which is the juniper here. We have the essence of cucumber as well. Right? Boom. Now the proper pour is meant to stir this gin and tonic for you, essentially. So you sh there should be no stirring required. And this is going to not only salvage the carbonation of the gin and tonic, but it's also going to shoot the tonic straight to the bottom of the glass, right? So we'll put this in and we're going to pour it straight down the spoon. And again, this is going to shoot the tonic straight to the bottom of the glass and essentially stir it for you, pushing the gin to the top and conserving some carbonation. Great. Now that we're done there, we've got the essence of juniper, essence of cucumber, and now in the spray bottle, we've got some rose water. So that's going to that's going to totally cloud your crowd your uh, crowd your sinuses, give you some of that fun uh, fun scent, 
which is going to be entirely different than what you actually taste. So the rose water itself <sighs> smells very floral, very, very nice, very light, very refreshing. It's like a natural perfume, right? Uh, but the taste of it is extremely bitter. So if anybody is looking for a gin and tonic that's not too sweet because the tonic water tends to run a little sweet, rose water is going to be your way to go. It's going to cut the sweetness, and it's also going to give you that nice aromatic, okay? So the essence of juniper, rose, and cucumber in your Hendrix gin and tonic. Um, and it is delicious. We'll serve this with two uh, short cocktail straws as well. And great, this is probably our most popular, one of our most popular for sure. Um, a lot of people ask, why is the tonic water red? Why is it pink? Why is it orange? Whatever color that we get, we get, get asked for. Um, why? It's because of the cinchona bark. It's actually tree bark. So when we get this tree bark, we order it from Peru. When it comes in from Peru, it's actually going to be ground. Um, you open it up and it will just, it, it almost takes, it almost consumes the room. Um, I'm, I'm always left coughing every time I have to prep, prep the tonic just because it gets all up in everything and it's powder. It's tree bark, so it comes in at the color of a tree bark. Um, so that's where you get the quinine, that's how you extract the quinine. So we have quinine in there, uh, we've, got, we've got some sugar, um, we've also got uh, lemongrass, fresh lemon, fresh lime, fresh orange juice and zest. Um, yeah, and a little bit of citric acid as well with some water. So we're going to take that and we'll carbonate it after we finish the cooling process, which takes about a day. Uh, we'll carbonate it and then we will bottle it and serve it. So this is how the gin and tonics will be uh, put out. And yeah, very, very different. Um, again, it's kind of a fun little process, but um, we're doing it the way that the Spaniards do it and we're doing it the way that the Spaniards want to do it. So yeah. Um, with that though, um, yeah. With that, I guess I will, uh, I will go ahead and leave you. So we talked, about, we talked about masculine, we talked about feminine, we talked about that gray period in between. Talked a little bit about the Navy strength as well and why that's kind of a fun little difference. Um, we've talked about the tonic water and how to properly serve a gin and tonic, why we serve it that way. And um, again, I really want to stress that masculine and feminine that may or may not be on your test. Hint, hint, wink, wink. All right. Next week is my favorite class. Uh, we do beer and whiskey. Uh, I'm very, very excited about, about that. We're talking about all sorts of different styles of beers from Saisons to Porters. Uh, we'll talk about whiskeys from single malts to blended Scotch whiskeys to bourbons and, uh, and Canadian whiskeys. So stay tuned. We'll see you then. And thanks so much for stopping by.